Good morning. Welcome back to our collaborative Black Health Summit. I am Deidre Johnson, CEO and Executive Director for the Center for African American Health. Thank you for joining us so much today. We appreciate you carving time out of your Saturday for this second day of our very first virtual collaborative Black Health Summit. During the summit, please use the hashtag C-A-A-H-C-B-S-H-21 on your social media. There's still time to register today, so we encourage others to visit. Um, you can register at www.whova.com backslash web backslash CBHS dash 202 This virtual event would not have been possible without the general support of our sponsors, and we'd like to take a moment to thank them. Common Spirit, Novartis, the, Col the Colorado Health Foundation, Colorado Access, Connect for Health Colorado. Your generous support has made this summit possible. We would also like to thank the team at the Rocky Mountain Public Health Training Center that's helping us handle the technology for our summit. So for a little technical housekeeping today, in this webinar, you are muted and will only see the presenters and their slides. You can find the chat box down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can select all panelists if you have any technical issues. You can also chat to everyone in the group. Please take a moment and let us know what city and state you're joining us from by putting it in the chat. So we moved into our new building last January. Here's a short video about our capital campaign. We've done a lot of things in the museum with different partners, but there are none that are more important than our partnership with the Center for African American Health. As a pastor, I think it's critically important uh, for churches to be a part of their community. And it's one of the things that I love about the Center for African American Health. The Center for African American Health is an organization that is committed in all senses of that word to improving the physical and mental health of the Black African American community in, in the Metro Denver region. It offers services and education to the community that has long been neglected by people in charge and the medical community. Uh, our organization is in the community, is a part of the community, uh, is working in the community to be a partner, not only with churches like my own, uh, but to be a partner with so many different organizations and with families and schools. Providing invaluable resources to the community, including testing and distribution of PPE, supporting those in need who've lost their jobs. The data is clear. Those most likely to be on the front lines during this pandemic, those most likely to have underlying health conditions and therefore devastating outcomes during this pandemic, and those who are losing jobs or businesses and having to homeschool children without adequate technology or housing or food are probably women. And they are most likely to be women who are Black, Latina, and Indigenous. My name is Seneca Donald, and I've been taking a few programs that the Center for African American Health offers. I took the Aging Mastery Program, and that was really great, helpful information. I got to bond and meet with several of the participants and um, really enjoyed it, the weekly classes. And now I'm in the journey to wellness, and that's great also. It's really been helpful and uplifting. Um, I love their programming and I love what they're doing in the community. We need to fund this organization and, and as it grows and grows because it's just a real benefit to the community. It's in a great place. Yes, please fund the Center for African American Health. So to help us start this day, we have a very special guest. Five-time Grammy winner, Diane Reeves is the preeminent jazz vocalist in the world. As a result of her breathtaking virtuosity, improvisational prowess, and unique jazz and R&B stylings, 
Reeves received the Grammy for Best Jazz Vocal Performance for three consecutive recordings, a Grammy first in any vocal category. Ms. Reeves has recorded and performed with Wynton Marsalis and the, uh, and the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra. She was fe a featured so soloist Ooh. with Sir Simon Rattle and the Berlin Philharmonic. Reeves was the first creative chair for jazz for the Los Angeles Philharmonic and the first vocalist to ever perform at the famed Walt Disney Concert Hall. When Reeves' holiday collection, Christmas Time is Here was released, Ben Ratliff of the New York Times raved, Miss Reeves, a jazz singer of frequently astonishing skill, takes the assignment seriously. This is one of the best jazz Christmas CDs I've ever heard. Miss Reeves' most recent release, Beautiful Life, Features Gregory Porter, Robert Glasper, Layla Hathaway, and Esperanza Spaulding. Produced by Terry Lynn Carrington, Beautiful Life won the 2015 Grammy for Best Jazz Vocal Performance. Reeves is the recipient of honorary doctorates from the Berklee College of Music and the Juilliard School. In 2018, the National Endowment for the Arts designated Reeves a jazz master, the highest honor that the United States bestows on jazz artists. It is my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce Denver's own, Ms. Diane Reeves. Thank you very much. It is a great honor to be here. So what I decided to sing for you is really just the basis of, of everything that we do, and that is serving and helping people and helping them to help themselves. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Moore. Um, that was a beautiful song. Thank you to Mrs. Reeves. Um, we might be a little bit early, just want to um, just give a heads up. We do have our next performer up here. Um, it's going to be um, Mr. Charles Doss. Um, so Mr. Charles Doss is best known as Mr. Charles. Uh, he has been teaching community members for years how easy it is to stay healthy and have fun through the power of dancing. Um, so please, um, you know, we want to encourage everybody to really just uh, get into this next piece. Um, if you're in a space there, you can actually get up and dance as well. Um, please enjoy this live dance lesson and activity by Mr. Charles and the Let's Start Dancing crew. Mr. Charles, whenever you're ready, I know we're a little early, please take it away. And um, and please everybody just uh, be patient. We're making sure they get set up on their end so that we can be able to get them live here. Okay, can you guys hear us? Yes, we can. Okay, one moment. And can you see anything yet? <laughs> it looks like you're sharing your screen. <laughs> but you're not, wait, we're gonna do the video. I'm trying to get Mr. Charles on. Uh, let's see. I'm sharing my screen, but I'm not sure you all are seeing the video. Uh, right now we're seeing it looks like you might be on the phone. We're seeing the yeah. Can you but can, can you see Mr. Charles at all? No, we can't. Okay, we having a little issues here. I am on an iPhone. We couldn't get his um, laptop connected. Oh. And I am sharing. <laughs> Is there something else I need to do with my settings? You probably don't need to share the screen because that camera will do the work for you. Okay, hold on. Yeah, yeah if you're gonna be using the camera, but we can see you okay. are. One moment. Now there we see. We there they are. How's that? Okay, right. sorry about that. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Mr. Charles. 
And this is the Let's Stop Dancing crew. Some of them, so many of us. So we're going to go ahead and get you started this morning. I'm going to teach it something simple because we haven't danced in four months. Okay, so let's get you up to exercise real quick. So now we got 15 minutes. We'll go ahead and get started. Here we go. Remember how you used to skate back in the day? This is like you're skating. You're going to go right, left, right, left. Four counts, it's mostly line dance, four and eight counts. Take this right foot and go right, right, turn. Right, left, right, left, 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 right, left. We go over it all again. And you're gonna come back with your right foot four times. One, two, three, four. Take this right foot, it's quarter turn. You're gonna go right, left, left. Right, we're going to end this dance. Back to right, right, left, right. Left. That's the whole dance. We do it all the way around. So we'll go over it all over again. I want to see that turn my back. So everybody can see. Let's do it this way. That's all right. Ready? Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, five, and we get back for one, two. Three, four, right, right, tap, left, tap, one, two, three, four. That's it. Now the ladies will be popping the fan. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a little too, right? So are you ready? <laughs> All right, let's get going. So we have, don't have too much time. This is called Ooh Wee. Ooh Wee. It's a right side thing. That's the main thing we do around here. Five, six, seven, go. Ain't no Thank <laughs> you. 
It's a long time to start, so I have to run and join you. All right, are you ready? All right, this is a little bit more energy. And remember, people, you're at home, so you should not be ashamed to get up and dance. <laughs> Nobody's going to see you, but you. maybe that to give you an encouragement after all this is over. You come out and do this. A lot of the same. All right, we ready? We're going to go right out, then out, step and turn. Uh huh, that's too rough for people. <laughs> right out, left out, up and back. Y'all step and turn, I do up and back. Same thing. Five, six, seven, go. Right out, left out, back. Again, right out, left out, up and back. What do you want to do? Now, here you get to get your shape. Do a little wiggle wiggle. It's like eight kind of One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. What kind of count? Now, next step, right foot. You want to go right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, left, right, 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 left, Left, right. Right, left, left, right. Make sure when you said it, just say right, left, right. You're going to end this dance. It's like a four. You can even do a four count or eight count. You're going to rock. One, two, to the back. Three. Oh. One time for the back, ready? Five, six, seven, go. Right out, left out, left turn. Turn. Wait. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, kick. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, kick. Right, left. Left. Right. 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 So, this is, I never know. We love popping on fans. Anyway, we're going to try it. Everybody ready? Kind of like African songs. All right. We do that at the fundraiser. Fundraiser. Now, it's going to take me a second because I have to start from here. 28 now. So, when you, while you're getting ready, just go get your book. All right. I'm going to make a health fair. I guess we might. We got it all. It doesn't move. All right. Five, six, five, six, seven, go. Up, up, up. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you, Mr. Charlie. For the fun. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mr. Charles. So as we know, when policy is being decided that impacts all of us, it is critical that communities have a voice. We're pleased today to be joined by several members of Colorado's Black Legislative Caucus. However, first, U.S. Representative Joe Neguse was not able to join us today, but was able to send us a video message. Hello everyone, my name is Joe Goose, and I'm proud to represent Colorado's 2nd Congressional District in the United States Congress, uh, as well as uh, serve as Colorado's first Black Congressman in the U.S. House. Though I'm sorry I can't be with you live today, I wanted to take a moment to applaud all the efforts of the Center for African American Health and the engagement of each of you here today. I know all of you are well aware of the disparities in health care and health outcomes for people of color, particularly folks in the Black community. Even before the pandemic hit, it was critical that health policy and the care being given in our communities acknowledge and intervene in social determinants of health and the unique barriers to care faced by communities of color. With the pandemic's devastating effects hitting our communities the hardest and thus underscoring what each of you already knew about the disparities rampant in healthcare, your work has never been more critical. We need community-based, evidence-based interventions in health disparities. Just as the Center for African American Health demonstrates in your work each and every day, I know that there are many gathered here who partner in this work, and I share my deep appreciation to you for all of those efforts. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing 
during this trying time in our communities, but also for all that you did before the pandemic and all that I know you will continue to do once the pandemic recedes. You truly make all the difference for the black community and thereby for the well-being and health of our community overall. I hope that the summit today is beneficial and I look forward to working with each of you moving forward. Until then, stay safe, take good care. Wonderful. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our representatives who are here today. Representative Jennifer Bacon. Actually, I don't know if she's here yet. Let me, well, first I'll do all the, the reading and then we'll see who's been able to join us. Senator James Coleman was born and raised in Park, the Park Hill neighborhood of Denver and currently lives in Denver's Green Valley Ranch neighborhood and represents Senate District 33 in Northeast Denver. When he was elected to his first term in 2016, Coleman was the youngest Colorado state legislator. Senator Coleman served as vice chair of the Senate State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee and is a member on both the Senate Business Labor and Technology Committee and Senate Appropriations Committee. When not in the Capitol, Coleman serves as executive director of FaithBridge, a local nonprofit mo mobilizing faith communities to improve K through 12 education in the state of Colorado. His passion for faith-based community service began when he was licensed and ordained as a minister at the age of 13 and began preaching in churches and communities across the Metro Denver area. Coleman earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology with a minor in business administration from Oral Roberts University. Coleman met his wife, Shayna Coleman, in the eighth grade, and they were proud parents of twins, James Jr. and Naomi. Representative Tony Exum Sr. Tony Exum has lived in Southeast Colorado Springs for more than 60 years. After serving more than 35 years as a firefighter, with the Colorado Springs Fire Department, rising to the rank of battalion chief. Tony retired in 2010. He then won election in 2012 to serve in the Colorado House of Representatives as representative from District 17, covering Southeast Colorado Springs. Representative Exum won election again in 2016 and 2018. He currently sits on the House Education Committee and is chair of the House Transportation and Local Governance local government committee. Representative Nikita Ricks is the Colorado State Representative for House District 40 and the first Liberian American to be elected to a U.S. State Assembly. She's the co-founder and president of the African American, <clears throat> excuse me, of the African Chamber of Commerce of Colorado and the founder of the African Economic Development Center. She knew the value of education when she arrived in America in 1980 and worked hard to achieve her Bachelor of Science degree in accounting from Metropolitan State University in Denver. She has also received her Master's in Business Administration from the University of Colorado, Denver. Representative Ricks is fighting for policies that expand the quality of life for Colorado residents by expanding apprenticeships, continuing access to education and affordable housing, her goals are to grow businesses, make healthcare more equitable, and be a voice for the marginalized. And I will go ahead and, um, she's not here yet, but in case she can join us today. Representative Jennifer Bacon is an educator, school administrator, lawyer, and community organizer. Jennifer has committed her career to advancing opportunities through education from a young age, her family instilled in her the belief that education is a freedom and set her on the path to earn a JD from the College of William and Mary. A master's education from Florida International University and a bachelor's in business management from Tulane. Jennifer is the proud homeowner in Montbello and she enjoys being out and about in the Denver community. I first of all want to thank all of you for joining us today. I know you're very, very busy, plus it's the weekend. So we appreciate you being here. 
just to start us off, you know, we we talked about last evening that COVID-19 has merely highlighted the inequities experienced by Black and African Americans for generation. We know that COVID-19 has not only caused excess illness and death, but it has wreaked havoc on our social determinants of health. With 50% of Black businesses lost, education disparities heightened, job loss, evictions, food, insecurity, and continued uncertainty. Plus the impact of the crisis has also uh, meant that our state budget has taken a hit. Can each of you take five minutes and discuss how COVID-19 has impacted your work, as well as what you've identified as priorities for COVID-19 response and recovery? Ladies first, I'll pass it to Representative Ricks. Thank you so much, Senator Coleman and Deidre. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Representative Nikita Ricks from HD40 in Southeast Aurora. And yes, COVID has wreaked havoc on all, everything that we've known. Our whole world is in like a disaster right now. And uh, the social determinants of health, where you live, uh, your income, all of those things have been impacted and they were already impacted before COVID, but I think COVID just tore the veil off. And so now we have to deal with it. Um, as a legislator coming in uh, this first term, it's been, you know, COVID has been the center of everything. We are, as a legislator, my priorities are to put Colorado back to work to help our small businesses. Like you said, Deidre, over 50% of black businesses have gone under. And when, when the world comes back to normal, it's not going to look the same. A lot of businesses that we have gotten used to, the restaurants, the different services, are all been just going out of business, even the big chain stores and everything. So um, we are trying to put Colorado back to work. My priorities have included housing, making sure that there's resources for rent um, as a le legislator, um, ensuring that there's equal access to health care especially the COVID vaccine. Um, I did a pop-up clinic in our community that focused on immigrant and refugees who had been totally underserved. Uh, no, most of them did not know even how to access the COVID vaccine. And so these are, there's a series of clinic. Uh, me and Senator Buckner will be doing another clinic next Sunday uh, here within House District 40 to ensure that Black uh, immigrants, Black Americans, and people of color are getting the vaccine. The Black and Brown people are dying in high numbers. Um, only about 2% roughly of African Americans in the state have received the vaccine, and roughly probably about 11% Hispanic. So as a, that, that's a huge issue. If people do not get vaccinated, then we do not get back to normal. And the sooner all of us start to take this vaccine, we are then able to get back to normal way of life, visiting restaurants and you know, engaging in a normal life as we, we used to. One of the big things that has happened within COVID is that women have exited the workforce, mainly because they've had to take care of their children at home. And so that, that's a very important piece <clears throat> and a big part of the workforce that needs to get back to work. So those are places that we're trying to prioritize to ensure that women are able to get back into the workforce. <clears throat> and of course, small business recovery, making sure that our small businesses um, get the funds that they need so that they can stay afloat. A lot of them were not able to receive the PPP or the economic disaster loan. And <clears throat> as working with the chamber and then also as a legislator, I'm looking to see how we can outreach to those businesses. You have to hold their hands and make sure that, you know, they're actually applying and understand how to apply. And, uh, and, and walk them through the different barriers that stop them from applying. So there, there's a lot of work to be done and we're working as a uh, caucus to ensure that our black communities are prioritized and that they are getting the support that they need. So I, I thank you for being here and thank you for the work that you do uh, with the Colorado Black Health uh, Collaborative. Pass it to uh, Representative Exum. I always say uh, beauty before ugly. So it's your turn. 
<laughs> uh, thank, thanks for coming. And thanks, Ms. Deidre. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, share a few things with you. Uh, like Representative Ricks had, had stated, when the pandemic hit, the, legis the legislature uh, shut down for 10 weeks. Uh, when we came back, we passed a lot of bills to help people survive through the coronavirus crisis. Uh, to help combat many disasters caused by the pandemic, we passed more than a dozen pieces of legislation providing $270 million in grants and loans to small businesses, channeling ten, tens of millions of dollars in, in direct housing assistance, utility support, and mental health assistance, ensuring access to paid, uh, paid sick leave for Colorado workers, and expanding unemployment benefits, helping hardworking Coloradans make ends meet. Uh, this suit of COVID-19 relief bills also included uh, my house bill uh, 1410, providing 20 million in direct rental and mortgage assistance to Coloradans experiencing the financial need during the turbulent times. Also including 350,000 legal aid for renters at risk of eviction. Five months later, uh, in November 2020, Governor Polis uh, reconvened the legislature for a special session, and we passed more COVID relief bills. We passed direct relief for restaurants, bars, and other struggling small businesses, and we approved a package of bipartisan bills to help families stay in their homes, put food on the table, and keep the lights on and the heat going. Our Representative Kerry Tipper and I ran a bill together to add an extra $60 million for emergency housing assistance to landlords and households who are in financial need uh, during a uh, COVID-19, this include, also included $1 million for eviction legal assistance fund. So during the pandemic, my focus has been uh, finding funding to help people stay in their homes. We passed a lot of bills to do a lot of good work and we help people pay their rents and mortgage and help keeping them from getting evicted. And finally, I'll say that uh, uh, I've also been working uh, as a, Representative Ricks has said the Black Caucus has been working with the Governor's Equity Vaccine Task Force. Uh, I've been working here locally with uh, Peak Vista and also El Paso County Health and identifying uh, people of color who, uh, who sometimes don't have access to the internet, especially folks that are over 70. Uh, Peak Vista has a program where they actually call people and let them know where they are. I visited a couple of clinics last weekend and uh, the word's getting out not only to the uh, 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 Black community, also to the Hispanic community, to the immigrant community with uh, translators. And we still have a lot of work to do uh, as more vaccines come forward. And again, I appreciate your time and the efforts that you're doing to help keep Colorado safe. God bless you. Thank you. Thank Brother you. James. Deidre. There we go. Deidre, thank you so much for having us. We appreciate it. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Representative Bacon's going to be able to join us, uh, but I did just send that back out to her. Thank you for getting that information out to us. And thank you for creating this platform for us to spend time with you. I'm actually sitting outside of the Center for African-American Health 3350 because I got to go to the post office. So I want to be really close to the Center for African-American Health <laughs> today. Uh, but this is right here in the Holly and Park Hill where I grew up. So I wanted to first say thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for serving on my health care cabinet and thank you for having this right in the heart of the community I grew up in. It's a, I'm so glad to see your name, the name of the, the organization on the side of this building. Uh, everything has already been said. Uh, that The fact that during COVID-19 since last year and even to this new legislative session, uh, we at the legislature, especially the members of the Black Caucus, have been really focused on all issues with the lens of how do we positively impact the Black community. We love everybody. We work to help everybody. All the bills we pass, pass for the entire state, not just our districts, not just for black community, but we think about the black community as we're having these conversations, we see it through that lens. And so you've heard about healthcare, you've heard about business, you've heard about housing. Um, I would add a couple of uh, other really quick areas. Number one is uh, when we were talking about vaccine distribution, equitable vaccine distribution, part of that was folks who were incarcerated. We've been working with the governor to make sure that folks who are incarcerated have access uh, and, and, and just put a highlight on that because someone who committed a crime uh, doesn't mean they're not a human being. Um, and it's just trying to make sure that those folks have resources as well. And not just COVID-19 vaccine related resources, but continuing to have 
correctional resources to get folks what they need so that they if they do the crime they do the time but they get out of prison ready to get back into society or out of the jail system and continuing to work with our law enforcement agencies uh, across the state of Colorado as well uh, to make sure that the, the things that really sparked uh, a lot of fire in the last year uh, number one was COVID but number two I think really close second was uh, George Floyd and the protests and all that happened across the country. So criminal justice is still a big focus for us and we're continuing to not only look at new policy this year to strengthen the work we did last year with the uh, integrity and accountability bill, um, but making sure the bills that we do pass are being implemented effectively and the things are getting done that we sought out to do when we pass those bills. You know, the second area really quickly I'll touch on is education. Uh, I have two children. Uh, in the K-12 school system here in Colorado, uh, in Denver Public Schools, in the fourth grade. Uh, and so I can, I can speak to this very specifically. One of our big focuses is going to be how we make sure that we get additional resources and funding for our kids in the K-12 system. When COVID-19 hit and our students uh, began doing remote learning at the end of the last school year, we didn't know what, what we were doing. But our teachers uh, came in with curriculum still we're able to provide resources and educate our students effectively throughout the end of the year. And now we're in a new school year, about to complete this one in the second semester. Uh, and I think what's been really critical is continuing to work with folks like Representative Bacon, uh, who's also serving on our school board here in Denver uh, and others to say, how do we make sure we get food to our students? How do we get technology to our students because of virtual remote learning? Some of our students are going back in person, but, but uh, some of our students haven't yet some of our students aren't able to or, or have opted to stay uh, remote learning. And so making sure that we focus on equity in all areas, but in particular education has been really important because this has been a tough year for everybody, including our educators. Uh, our educators just received the vaccine earlier this month. And there was a lot of concern about whether or not they were gonna be able to get it to have our kids back in person learning. Our higher education, um, system has not received vaccines for their educators unless they independently were able to access them. And so making sure we're prioritizing our educators so that they can continue to provide a quality education for our students is also a priority. So I wanted to hit on a couple of those really quick areas and, um, and, and realizing that although we see COVID-19 as a healthcare pandemic, it has exacerbated other problems we've had in our communities for a very long time. And I thank you Deidre, for the partnership with Center for African American Health, because you all do this, this, this work year round. You weren't doing it just at COVID, you were doing it prior to COVID uh, and you'll do it in perpetuity and, 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 and not because we continue to have the highest numbers of folks not being vaccinated, not having access, uh, continuing to be sick, having pre-existing conditions. It's because you believe it's the right work to do and we believe it is uh, as well. So we thank you for this opportunity and look forward to more questions. Thank you. You know, um, you all touched upon the fact that odds are things are going to look a little different for all of us. And to me, that feels like a huge opportunity because, you know, going back to normal doesn't mean going back to things working for everybody. Can each of you take a few minutes to talk about how communities impact the policymaking process and the most effective ways communities can make their voices heard in helping you do the work that you do? Sure, thanks for the question, Deidre. Um, I think the community is why we're there. We are elected by the people and we're there for the people. And that's the work that we, are, we swear in to do in the state legislature. It's important that we stay in contact with our constituents and that the constituents stay in contact with us, especially in this time. A lot of what we do is constituent services where people are writing us about unemployment issues. Uh, getting their W-2s because they didn't get W-2s from the Colorado Department of Labor, um, you know, looking for resources for the vaccine or looking for resources for uh, rent assistance. So all of that is part of what we do and a big part of what we do. We try to re be responsive to our uh, constituents because they're the ones who send us there. I think, and, and when it comes to the different bills, people write all the time. Uh, I serve on the Business and Labor Committee and also on the Public Health and Human Services Committee. 
And there's a lot of things that come through those committees. Recently, there were some bills around marijuana or the unions. You get a whole bunch of emails from people in our constituents writing us and telling us how they want us to vote. How do they feel about it? And I think that the role that our uh, constituents can play is keeping in touch with us, writing us, calling our offices, telling us about issues that they uh, care about and how they want us to respond to them. We're here to serve. They can also come down to the committee and uh, be a witness on issues that they care about. It's been, it's very easy now. You can do it by Zoom and have Zoom access to do it so you don't have to come down into the Capitol. And I just think is is important because what I do is driven by community. Um, I'm there to serve and it's such an honor and a privilege to be there. I want to expand the big tent. And so I think that as long as people just need to continue to talk to us, engage us and write to us, you know, and, and just call us and let us know what they care about and what they want to see. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Ms. Deidre again, and thanks Representative Ricks. I'll, I'll just piggyback on a couple of things that, uh, that Representative Rick said, uh, you know, some of the best bills that I've run uh, at the state legislature came from ideas from uh, constituents in my district. Uh, for example, I ran a, a bill to protect uh, clean water by banning the use of toxic PFAS firefighting foam. Uh, that came to me from an activist who was affected by the water contaminated by PFAS spills in the wide field security and fountain area. Uh, uh, they wanted the uh, toxic foams banned, and so we, we they explained the problem to me. Uh, I ran the bill to ban toxic foams and protect our waters. Uh, you know, that was a good idea for those bills. Uh, so to piggyback on what uh, Representative Ricks was saying, uh, if you have an idea that should be law uh, or should be repealed, definitely make an effort to share your idea with your legislator. And please reach out to us, you know, in different ways, like uh, Representative Rick says, you know, email uh, where ideas can be written down and, and studied in detail. Uh, and the more re research that you do on the idea that you have, uh, the better it is, because when we get the idea, we can share that uh, with our legal counsel to make that, uh, to put that in bill language. Uh, uh, Meeting in person uh, sometimes is going to be going to be tough, so the, the Zoom is it's going to uh, going to be best. Uh, and make an effort to make uh, your request uh, the information as specific as possible. Uh, you know we can't run bills to to end racism or to cure poverty, but we can run bills to to ban specific tactics and pass laws to encourage cities to build to. Uh, to impact uh, uh, police tactics. And we can encourage, uh, we can run laws to encourage cities to build more affordable housing. So be clear and, and, and concise as possible and reach out in, in every way possible. We're here to uh, not only to support you and represent you, uh, but to make, uh, or make lives better uh, for Colorado. So thank you again. All, all so great you, answers. Uh, Oh, thank you, brother. All great answers. Uh, the question again was, how does community impact policy? Uh, short answer, by doing more than just voting. Voting is very important, but the real work begins the day after the election. Because we need to see you as much as y'all saw us during the campaign cycle. You probably saw mailers, you got phone calls, emails, you're probably inundated with ads on social media, and all of a sudden it went away. But now it's time for you all to really engage with us and us to engage with you. And so one real quick example of what that looked like last year, again, going back to what was sparked by George Floyd and the protests was when we had Senate Bill 217 led by uh, Representative Herod, our chair of the Black Caucus, and also uh, Senator Rhonda Fields uh, and others, but the two members of the Black Caucus uh, who, who led that bill in the House and the Senate. That kind of bill, that kind of legislation had been run yearly. The difference between the other times it was run and this last year when it got passed is that you all were out on the lawn of the Capitol in the Capitol Circle on the west side protesting and we could hear you outside. So people knew that this was a movement. It was not a moment. It was not a legislative session. 
It was not just a, a time where we run bills. This was an opportunity for us to really pass what I like to call seismic policy. And it was the first in the country to do so. We here in Colorado were able to do that. So community, is, is, as it's been said, coming to the Capitol, whether it's outside protesting, letting your voice be heard in that way, testifying in a committee, which by the way, you can testify in a committee, in any committee remotely. You do not have to be in person if you're concerned about your health and showing up in COVID-19. And so on any issue or any bill that we have, you can sign up to testify and give perspective, share information, ask questions of the committee if you'd like. So I think that that's really powerful. Um, we need you all. We really do. The last way I'll say is, you know, sometimes we have to intentionally reach out to you all. You know, I've been blessed to know Deidre Johnson, Center for African American Health for a, for a while. But 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 it's it was my ask of her and her willingness, uh, along with Dr. Rhonda Coleman, uh, the, the chair of our health care cabinet for Senate District 33, to say, hey, would you be willing to join and advise us on how we should vote, share with us policies that we should be working on? Because I'm not a health care expert. I don't I, I don't work with the Center for African-American Health and work with experts all the time. But she does. And, and other folks do, like Dr. Rock, Rhonda Coleman, Dr. Terry Richardson are also on my cabinet. So, so this is not just about me, and this is not something that, that I, I, I take just for myself. The fact that uh, Deidre and I are friends, family, and she does great work and we work together, she said, let's have a panel, let's have a discussion, let's answer some questions. And we were able to bring along other members of the Black Caucus to do so. So um, I think that we just have to make an intentional effort to reach out and kudos to you, Deidre, for creating an opportunity and platform for us to be able to engage with community today. Well, thank you. And um, we appreciate beyond words what you guys do and what you have to navigate on a daily basis. We have a question that came in for Representative Exum. Please expand on the $60 million bill that relates to the monetary help for landlords who are impacted by the pandemic. Um, has this been has this been implemented, and how, what does it mean for landlords and tenants? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, to access uh, uh, those funds, you go through uh, DOLA, uh, the Department of uh, Labor and Affairs, and there's information on that website on how to access those funds. Uh, landlords are, are eligible. Uh, if they're trying to help their tenants uh, uh, stay in their stay in their homes, and we we did that specifically uh, because it, uh, there's many landlords out there that that uh, that have to pay their bills, but they they want to have access to the, those funds too to help those tenants uh, stay. Uh, and if you're having any uh, any difficulty uh, accessing that, you know, contact myself or any other. Uh, any of the other uh, 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 Black Caucus legislators, but the site is DOLA, D-O-L-A, uh, and you can find out uh, uh, more information on how to access those uh, those funds. Rep Exum, I just put the link to DOLA in the chat, so if anyone wants to see that, or we can, we can make sure you get that information, but thank you. That's a great answer. So um, can, you, can you all share what some of your current legislative priorities are going forward that we might not have touched upon yet? Um, so this, this session, my, my freshman session, I'm excited to be running a few bills. Um, one of them is in a housing bill. This bill will look at people who are paying market rent who may not have um, a deep credit profile they can opt into a voluntary program to get their rent, their rental history reported on their credit. Um, if they opt in, then mandatorily they need to take a financial literacy class that will help them to save money, learn about the home buying process. It will also um, give, teach them their rights as a, as a tenant and teach them about credit and managing their credit. The idea behind this bill is that if you are paying market rent and you could be paying a mortgage, by learning more about what it takes to become a homeowner, instead of taking five years to become a homeowner in 10 years, you might be able to do that in two and a half and cut the time down. In addition to that, I'm running a bill around teacher diversity. 
is important that people in K through 12 education get to see themselves, uh, meaning black and brown teachers uh, who will be, who are their role, role models. Um, students spend more time in the classroom, you know, second only to being at home. So these are people who are their role models. And so we're looking to see how we can increase teacher diversity and also transparency on being certified as a teacher. I'm also running and co-priming co a bill with Representative Carrie Tipper around immigration. Uh, deportation of uh, immigrants is one of the only places where you do not get your day in court or access to a defense. And so we're looking to see if we can do a defense fund. Denver has a current program that is successful and working, and we're hoping that we can do implement something statewide. And I also have something else, some other things, but um, I won't talk about them now. But those are some of the bills that I'm, I'm really uh, thrilled about right now. Thank you. Uh, thanks again, Ms. Teacher. Uh, a couple of bills that I'm, I'm working on. Uh, one is the uh, foster, foster Kids Driver Education uh, Bill. Unfortunately, we had to PI that bill last year due, uh, due to COVID. But it, it basically just authorizes the Department of Human Services uh, through the Child Welfare Services Division to reimburse county child welfare departments for costs paid to public and private driving schools for classes used to help youth in foster care with their training they need for driver's license. And the reason for the bill is uh, to be uh, to be honest with you, you know, uh, foster kids are probably driving. And they're just driving without licenses. They're driving without insurance. And so this bill is very important. So it's kind of like a rite of passage. It's going to help make our streets safer. Uh, so I'm excited about uh, about that bill. The other bill uh, that I'm uh, uh, Representative Herod asked me to join her is uh, funding uh, for safe uh, revitalization of our main streets. And this bill transfers $30 million from the general fund to the state highway fund to provide additional funding for the Department of Transportation re revitalizing main streets and safer main streets program. Uh, these are project ready uh, programs uh, in different parts of our state. And the last thing that I may be working on, I haven't decided on this one yet, but I was asked to consider, uh, and that's to uh, the, uh, let me find my note here is to modify the Colorado Opportunity Scholarship Initiative Advisory Board. It's, uh, the Colorado, uh, it's a scholarship program for eligible post-secondary students administered by the Colorado Department of Higher Education. The program uh, grows community efforts and engages private donors to increase available scholarships well beyond the investment from the state. So that's a few, few things that I'm working on. I'm sure there's a few other things that'll probably be coming my way. Uh, but thanks again for the opportunity. All great stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll close up uh, with some of the things that I'm working on. I have three major priorities the next three, the next four years. Uh, one is eliminating youth violence. And part of that is by providing opportunities for our students K-12 that maybe they don't have right now. And one of the bills that I'm working on this year to address that issue is if you're a student in your senior year of high school and you've completed enough credit hours to graduate, you're basically wasting a year where you don't have anything to do. And we're passing the bill this year. It's going to give you access to college in your senior year of high school, different than concurrent enrollment because concurrent enrollment requires you to be taking a high school level course while taking college. This is strictly being able to take advantage of college while you're in your senior year because you've completed enough credit hours to graduate. Uh, so that's one bill we're working on. A second priority for me is eliminating prison recidivism. Folks who get out of prison and have to go back into prison. And so what I'm working on uh, for that area, three bills. Uh, one is every person coming out of the criminal justice system should have personal identification. Folks don't have that when they get out all the time. Without ID, you can't get housing, you can't get a job. So those are, that's one bill I'm working on. A second bill that I'm working on is if you've gone to prison or jail, you've done the time for the crime when you get out, sometimes that record, uh, especially if it's a nonviolent offense, follows you the rest of your life. And, and prevent you from being able to get access to employment or housing. And so we want to, uh, we have a process in Colorado now where you can automatic, where you can seal, have your record sealed so that it doesn't affect you when you go to apply for a job or for housing. Uh, but the process to seal your record is cumbersome and expensive. And so we want to automatically seal records of folks after a certain period of time 
once their sentence is complete. And in addition to sealing automatically, we would therefore help cover the costs of the sealing process. A lot of folks are still dealing with something they did 18 years ago. There was a nonviolent offense. And so that we want to, we want folks to be able to get back to work, get back to life um, after, after they've served their time. Uh, so automatically sealing records uh, for nonviolent offenders. And then the third and final bill there, and I think this is really important for the work you do, Deidre, uh, a lot of folks who are in the criminal justice system, when they get into the criminal justice system, we don't assess whether or not they have traumatic brain injuries. So I'm working on a TBI bill that would provide resources, dollars for any individual going into the criminal justice system to have an assessment regarding traumatic brain injury to see how we better serve them while they're there. There are folks that we're serving just like everybody else. And we have no idea that they have a traumatic brain injury or how to assist them while they're in the criminal justice system. So that's a bill I'm working on as well. My, my third category, which I'm, I'm trying to figure out what we can work on for this is eliminating the black wealth gap. Uh, so it's a big issue that we're working on uh, at the legislature as well. Uh, we know that in terms of wealth, African-Americans have significantly less than our white counterparts. And a big part of that is not having access to the things that Nikita, excuse me, Representative Ricks and Representative X have, uh, have talked about, whether that's access to housing. That's really important to have ownership of a home in order to build wealth, ha wealth having a job. That's really important in order to build wealth. The last thing I'll share really quickly, and I'm really proud of this, and I, I thank you, Deidre, and, and our healthcare cabinet for helping to work with this. Um, through the work of Jerry Johnson, uh, Tanya Kelly Bowery, um, and others at CU Anschutz, we were able to, just this last week, get approved for an endowment for African-American medical students to get scholarships to go to CU Anschutz uh, to be able to get their medical degrees. This is something that we've been working on for a couple of years, and we were able to get that. Some more information on that, so you can push that out. These are the folks who may have an interest in being doctors and want to have some help in getting their medical degrees. Um, shout out to uh, former Mayor Wellington Webb, who really helped lead that initiative as well, and also uh, Dr. Andrew Piccioni of the Department of Higher Education. Uh, so those are some of the things that I'm working on, and collectively, uh, I'm just proud to be a part of the Black Caucus and work on these issues with my, with my colleagues. And my understanding um, is that Dr. Terry Richardson, who was with us last evening, um, did some heavy lifting on the fundraising for that one. Absolutely. Yes. Dr. Terry Richardson, shout out to her. I'm going to get in trouble because I didn't mention her name. And there's somebody else that I know I'm forgetting. Uh, but I also want to give a shout out to uh, Senator Janet Buckner, because she also did heavy lifting to get that and make that happen. Uh, and shout out to our chair, Representative Leslie Harrod, for helping as well. So all of you, if I forget your name, forgive me, beat me up later. But you know who you are, and I thank you because, um, especially during COVID nineteen, I I love everybody, but I'm I'm looking for black doctors to ask questions about what's going on, and so I'm grateful for that program to provide more scholars provide scholarships uh, for for black medical students. So our next question: Are there any bills that are taking into immediate consideration that nationally? Um, So, oh, some of HUD and state and local housing agencies. There's no data on COVID spread in low income housing, yep, which primarily serves communities of color. If not, when and why is this not taking precedence? A lot of missing data. Yeah, I'll just share really quickly. I think we should look into that. I think you're absolutely right when it comes to communities of color. Um, you know, I'll just talk about my district in particular. I think it's very similar to Representative Ricks and Representative Exum. You know, whether you're talking about low-income housing, project housing, uh, community housing, bungalows, there are people who are in a lot closer proximity to one another than folks who might have individual single-family residents that are spaced further apart. And we come into contact with folks up and down the stairs, going through the elevators, um, whatever that may be. I think in our communities, regardless of what your housing situation, your community looks like, we just have been lacking. So I think our responsibility is to make sure we hold accountable um, the governor, the state departments, um, uh, and, and also the resources, the bills that are being passed. When there are bills being passed or resources going out regarding COVID-19 and not just healthcare, you know, one question I have to ask, we have to ask as members of the Black Caucus, how does this impact the people of color in our communities? How does this impact Black community? How does this impact the immigrant community? because we all represent a diversity of people. Where we got elected is where we live, and that's who lives with us, uh, are folks who look like us more times than not. And so I think it's really important that we ask that question of every. I've been doing that, 
And I got to tell you, there are some folks who never thought about that. If I ask, you know, even I had a call yesterday regarding uh, the, co- the impact of COVID-19 on, on black, far- on, on agricultural workers, on farmers. And I just asked, you know, I would love to know how the, imp- what the impact on black farmers has been. Silence, right? Because number one, it's like, well, do we have black farmers? Yeah, we do. Matter of fact, one of them reached out to me just last week. Her name is Erica Crutcher. She lives in Bennett, just east of my district. And she has six other black farmers in a 25 mile radius. Nobody even knows who they are. And they're not being considered. And so I always ask that question. So when it comes to um, people of color, when it comes to our black community, uh, you know, I think it's important that we at least hold accountable the policies that we're being asked to vote yes on and ask how are these bills that wants to implement it going to not just go to, you know, everybody it always goes to. Does it also impact black community? So, you know, whatever the issue may be, I think it's important for us to just hold accountable. And then we need you as a community to not only um, hold us accountable, but if you're not in our districts, hold accountable your elected officials. Deidre Johnson asked, how can you get involved? You need to reach out to them and say, hey, look, I know that uh, you, you may not be an African-American legislator, but I am African-American and I'm really concerned about the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, and I don't feel like we're, they're being addressed for me. So what can I do to get engaged? How can I support you? And what are you going to do as my elected representative to make sure that we're getting for the black community what we need? Thank you. I'm going to make, I didn't realize we had black farmers. So I want to get some more information on that from you later. Um, Related to, you know, holding people accountable. One of my, I'd call it a growing pet peeve is that we do so much to tell people stay safe, wear masks. Um, And we know most of us can't work from home. So we're out and about working, but I haven't seen much holding workplaces accountable to make sure that their employees are protected. Some do, some aren't. And we hear about this mainly through reports from contact tracers when people have gotten COVID, that they may be working in a place that really isn't um, putting their health in the forefront. Is there anything that has been going on or is on the horizon to just do a little more accountability on that? I know, um, I believe Denver created like a five-star program, but it seemed like those five stars were just for doing what you should be doing already. You know, Deidre, you bring up a good point. Um, This past summer, I did some work on the the census before I got elected. And one of the plants that we visited was uh, Fort Morgan area where JBS, the meatpacking plant is. There's a lot of people of color that work at the meatpacking plant. And a lot of people started to get sick. Several people died, you know, there. And it seemed like, you know, the company was in denial. Um, I also got concerned like early on, like starting like around April um, or so when I was going to Walgreens and the cashiers did not have, you know, mask on, but we as customers were being told, yeah, you need to wear a mask. And I specifically remember walking up to one of the cashiers that she was a young uh, 20 something year old uh, woman. And I asked her, where was her mask? And she said, uh, well, the managers, you know, did not give us one. So at that point, I wrote the governor, and I think several people started to write him uh, with, with King Supers employees and people like that who were not wearing masks. So I know that the mandate for masks is there. There's still issues around the I mean, here in Colorado and around the country where people, you know, refuse to do it and they get into arguments. People have gotten shot because of the mask issue. So, you know, I think we just have to continue to to try to enforce it. I mean, most places say that you have to wear a mask in order to enter. And, you know, in the workplaces, you know, unless people are com- complaining or letting us know, we might not know that it's not going on. So again, I would, it's one of those things where I would say, write your legislator, uh, you know, complain, call the governor's office if you know of this going on. Because um, some places did not want to mandate in Aurora, I think Aurora did not did not mandate it uh, from, because local control is part of it too. Um, You know, it starts at the state level, but then the local governments have to also enforce um, the the mask rules. So um, yeah, I would say just get in contact with your legislature and and city councils and people like that to try to push if you see that there is a problem. Also, Ms. Dijon, to piggyback on what Representative Ricks has said, it's also important not to get in any confrontation 
with anybody at workplaces, but to document what you see, uh, ask to speak to the manager and report that, and then uh, report that to the, uh, uh, to the local officials, county health department, uh, to the governor's office. And I think because people have been doing that, we're seeing a, a better job. At least I'm seeing a better job in my community of people wearing masks. And they're, uh, and I say if you if you if you post the sign, if you post what the state uh, uh, state mandate is about uh, wearing masks, uh, then make sure you abide by that. But please do not get in any confrontation with folks. Just document what you see, the address, whatnot, and report that. Thank you. So we have another question that came in. Colorado Department of Corrections is so hard to influence when it comes to assessment and training. They staff their prisons. Okay, this is a question. Um, I'm gonna read it and be transparent. They staff their prisons with underqualified guards and do not properly train them to support the complex population they are working with. How will we ensure that those identified with brain injuries are then supported both in prisons then in community reentry, I worry they will get stuck without supporters. That's a great question. I'll answer that really quick here. Um, so the bill regarding traumatic brain injury came from three black men who collectively served 60 years in prison. It met me at the Northeast Denver Islamic uh, Center over here off of um, uh, Bruce Randolph and Carl Boulevard at the mosque. And they sat me down and gave me a bill draft and a full budget review on what it would cost in order to implement TBI across DOC in the state of Colorado. So I connected those individuals with the Department of Corrections and we've had multiple conversations since last summer. And in those conversations it's been made clear that we don't need to just pass this bill to your point, that's a great question. We have to implement it and see it through because there's a lot of funds, there's a lot of programs already in the Department of Corrections that are not working and we know that because there's a 50% recidivism rate for folks who are coming out of prison in the state of Colorado. I mean, it's half the folks who get out of prison go back within three to six months after they've been out and usually on petty offenses. So the way we hold them accountable to this is making sure that the community groups like Rebuild Your Mind, which is the group of these three black men who came to me and said, would you be willing to introduce a bill, are a part of the accountability. We wanna make sure that they are a part of what's going on to see that it is actually working. And I'll tell you how they know if it's working or not because they all served in prison with traumatic brain injuries and came out of prison and lead successful lives today. So I think it's important for us to end the bill, talk about that there's gotta be a level of accountability and auditing a sunset review of the bill um, after so long, maybe a year, two, three years to say, how is this bill working? But a part of that audit, a part of that accountability committee has got to be the folks who have experienced this and have come out of it successfully. It's got to be the state departments. It's got to be uh, the Department of Corrections. Uh, but I absolutely want to make sure that we as a community are involved. Because when we pass these bills, it's one thing for us to pass the bill to the legislature, but it's another thing to make sure that we equip you in the community to be ready to catch it. Bills get passed all the time. Bills get passed all the time. We pass all these bills in the state. We pass stuff federally and then money comes in. For instance, the, the business funding that Representative Ricks talked about. And when you look at the percentage of African-American businesses who got that money, it's not high. And a big part of that is the inequity in how the policy was passed. So we've, we've been very strategic in looking at how policy gets passed, the way it reads the bill language so that it doesn't disqualify us from being able to access those resources. Uh, but we also have to make sure that we communicate with you to say we need you to be ready. The bill gets passed January through May. The governor signs it June, July. By that time, the, this particular state department has a certain deadline by the time they have to implement this work. And we want to make sure that you are connected with the state department heads. Are you connected with the liaisons of the state department? Are you connected with whoever's responsible for going out and actually executing the work that we passed the law to do at the legislature? Um, so back to the Department of Corrections, it's important to make sure that those groups do get into the accountability and the audit of the bill that we're going to pass this year to make sure that we are not only doing the scans for traumatic brain injury, but we are showing that there's actual implementation, there's actual programs being created specifically for those individuals with those injuries. That's a great question uh, around accountability. Appreciate you. 
So um, you mentioned earlier eliminating the black wealth gap. What might that look like? Like how how would you? I'm happy to keep. I'm happy to keep talking, but I, I see Rep, <laughs> Rep Ricks and Rep Exum on here, so I'll, I'll be brief. I think um, one of the things that we really want to do is we want to figure out a way to invest capital in minority-owned businesses. Uh, Rep Ricks and I were on a call yesterday with um, Department of, oh gosh, no, Public Administration, uh, DPA, Jack Wiley, and um, this individual worked with then-Senator Angela Williams. Thank you, kudos, shout out to you for doing all the work around disparity studies for Black-owned businesses and women-owned and minority-owned businesses not being able to get government contracts. And the big reason why that is is because they said that we don't know how many exist. So we did a study to see how many of these businesses exist. And now that we've done that, I'm sure there's something else going to get thrown at us to say, well, you still can't do it. You know, when it comes to Black wealth, it's not about just giving out money. I, I know we've had a lot of people talk about reparations and different concepts, but I'll tell you what I think it is, what it means to me, and I pass it to my colleagues they like to share as well. To me, what it means is figuring out a way to invest in Black-owned businesses the way we did through Senate Bill 1. It was minority-owned businesses, but in Senate Bill 1, we were able to carve out a small portion of the overall small business relief fund uh, through the state legislature to give to those businesses so that they could then utilize to help them through COVID-19. But if we were able to give funding to those businesses because we know they're not getting access to capital, if they do, they got to go to a bank to get a loan with a high interest rate. It puts them in further debt. Maybe we don't have the best credit, but we got to work on credit building scores or, or credit score building habits like Representative Ricks is working on as well this year. But there's a, there's a lot we can do to invest in black owned businesses, because if you give us, if you help us create ownership, ownership equals freedom. Something that in this country, we as a black people continue to have to fight for. Uh, it just looks different in 2021 than it did in the 1900s and 1800s. We're still, unfortunately, slave to the master. Uh, we don't have money, so we had to go to the lender. The lender becomes the master. They give us a loan, but usually the rate is so high, it's hard for us to ever pay that back just to have some freedom. So being able to invest capital in the Black-owned businesses would be really critical because it helps create ownership in business, helps fuel our economic pipeline. It helps create jobs where we can have ownership and hire folks in our communities to do the work. And then the second thing I would say outside of uh, capital investing in the businesses is, is programs to create home ownership. Again, something else that I think Representative Rickson, and, and I know that uh, Representative Exum has talked about the importance of housing. If you can have ownership of that, that exponentially uh, increases your, uh, your propensity to build wealth. But if you're worried about where you're going to live tonight, where you're going to sleep, the last thing you're thinking about is building wealth. You're thinking about how am I going to stay out of the cold? It's cold outside. And so we want to figure out a way to have ownership uh, of both property, land, homes, but then also of our businesses so that we can be um, manufacturers and distributors and not just consumers. Along those lines, there's a question of, um, from my friend Chanel Reed, who runs Families Forward, how can you help support local municipalities implement minority contracting standards. Oral NAACP right now is working with the city to implement the program. So it really goes back to what you all were saying. Once it's passed, how do we make sure that it becomes reality? Yeah, I, I think that there needs to be monitoring. I know one of the bills that um, Representative Bacon is working on has to do with minority and women owned business procurement and looking at local governments to ensure that they are tracking how much dollars are being spent with minority and women-owned businesses. So that is something that she's working on and I'm, I'm a sponsor on the bill. Um, so we're, and, and if, yeah, again, it goes back to the whole proving the disparity. People don't believe you when you say, oh, well, you didn't, we're not spending money. So we have to then go do a study to see how many businesses are out there that are minority owned and then see what portion of those businesses have gotten contracts from the, the local government or the city or municipality. So we need to track that. Um, and then after that, I think, you know, the citizens and people there in these communities need to hold 
uh, these municipalities and, and places accountable. You have to, right? It's, you know, the state can mandate a law, but we also, you know, there needs to be a way that, that small businesses are going to the city council meetings and demanding that they get, you know, their taxpayers in these different cities and that they are getting a portion of those contracts and doing business with the city instead of it going to the good old boy network or to the people who have always gotten it because that's just how it is. We just have to hold things accountable. We cannot sit back on the sidelines anymore and hold our government officials accountable as well. So. Ms. Deja, further to uh, piggyback on that, <clears throat> I think we'd be, we need to be intentional about working with our uh, <clears throat> city and state officials. Uh, and I'll give you an example. If, uh, <clears throat> if a developer or a banker is going to do business in, in, uh, uh, in, in one of our communities, uh, and they're getting, uh, like I know in, in, in my city, uh, developers uh, get tax incentives uh, to, uh, to build. Uh, well, we need to, be, we need to be more intentional about what that contract looks like and saying in that contract that uh, are you going to, uh, that, that you're required to hire locally, or at least a portion of that, that, that you're required or a portion of your, of your management needs to be local. It needs to be uh, diverse people of color in order to get that tax incentive. These are the things that, uh, that need to happen. And I think if you make that, if you tighten up those, uh, those contracts and the tax incentives that are going out all over the state to different communities, uh, that's where we can bring about more fairness. I talked with a developer last week and it was kind of after the fact, this developer is developing in my district in Southeast Colorado Springs, and then wanted to call uh, people of color leaders and ask what, uh, what they can do. And I told her, I said, what, it's, it's a little late to call after you're doing the development because the housing that you're developing, uh, people in my district cannot afford it. So the next time you want to develop in my community, I shared this with her. I said, apply for a housing tax credit so that a portion of the housing development that you build will be below the medium income. So people that live in those communities can afford where you're developing and don't put it, don't put it on or don't put it off on uh, uh, the high construction costs. And I shared this uh, um, this with uh, the developer, I said, you know, the lumber that you're buying, it may cost more, but that lumber is the same lumber as far as the quality of lumber and the construction materials is the same material that it was 10 and 20 years ago. So the quality of it is the same. So if you're paying more for that <clears throat> and and then putting that cost upon uh, upon the uh, uh, upon the buyer, upon the owners. I told them that's not fair. You need to do your work up front and apply for those tax credits. And if you want to say that you're a part of, of helping uh, people that, uh, people of color that live in your community, then you need to be intentional about those efforts. Thank you so much. You know, this hour has flown by. Um, I definitely have a lot of things I want to follow up on, especially with you, um, Representative Ricks, about what's going on with women having to leave the workplace and how do we get them back in there. Um, I appreciate, we appreciate you taking time out today and what you do day to day, because we know it is not a walk in the park and that you are there um, representing us under the dome. Um, we're very fortunate to have I'm looking forward to seeing some seismic policy <laughs> coming forward. But again, thank you so much for your time. And um, we look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for having us. We appreciate it, Ms. Deidre. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna take a break and our next, um, Sessions will start at 1045.